Out of Shasta College. Here we are on Thursday, 2nd of December. Since we've got uh, a little over two weeks left as class, that's it. We're going to be focusing on cinema. Hopefully you all got my last lecture. You see what's expected, what's coming up, the changes in the syllabus. I'll be posting this week the topics for your final research paper. The quiz next week. You're going to have to watch a documentary for that, which I'll tell you about next week. And um, this week is a simple message, believe it or not. Jean-Luc Godard, the French filmmaker from an era of French filmmaking called The New Wave, which I'll talk about next week. It's too soon yet. It's the early 1960s, late 50s in the world at large. He was a critic and he became a director and directed some of the most famous films in the history of cinema. Breathless would be one of them, who's pushing 90 this year, I believe. Still out there, still trying to make films. That's how the need to tell our story is. That's how powerful it is. Anyway, he famously said everything is cinema. When he said it a long time ago, folks, it seemed quite possibly absurd. Um, if you live long enough and you love cinema, then you know he's right. Especially nowadays, when everybody tapes everything with these. You're all making little movies every day. Zipping them off to your friends. Snapchat. TikTok. YouTube. Everybody's a filmmaker now. Whether you're taking a shot of your cats or your dinner or skateboarding or other naughty affairs that you should not be taking movies of. All of a sudden, everything is cinema. This doesn't sound so absurd. Look around. How often do you hear people say, and yet we had another one this week, mass shooting in a high school, um, when they talk to eyewitnesses, they very often say, oh, I heard this pop, pop, pop going off, and it sounded like a movie. Because real life is a movie. A movie is real life. And we're also used to hearing pop, pop, pops in movies uh, that when we hear them in real life, we think it's a movie or we compare it to a movie. Um, car crashes, anything that happens out there, disasters, it was like a movie. That cinema is in our DNA whether we like it or not, whether you go to movies, we like movies, whether you value them, think they're worth it, think they're silly, think they're entertaining, think they're art. You cannot deny cinema. Now, hopefully you guys watched that first documentary I showed because I'm going to assign another one. Um, because we're going to go through the history of cinema here, decade by decade, hopefully. <laughs> then I have enough time to do all that. Uh, but right now, I want to come through, start where it kind of came up from 1900 to 19, after World War I the other day. Uh, and I'm always getting guys to look at the, the broader themes, broader con tent of why films exist the way they do. We're coming out of World War I, the war to end all wars. That's what they called it, folks, the Great War. Or we we're wrong of that, about that one. Never seen so much savagery in our entire history. We have now, we have automatic warfare, meaning automatic weapons. We have uh, our tanks, military tanks, and we have airplanes for the first time ever. 
So the slaughter is on a mass scale. We still are fighting the wars like we used to fight the wars before we had all those good slaughtering devices. Change, things changed after World War I. Uh, no more running and charging a machine gun. That's out. Too many lives are lost. Um, so we came out of World War I. We defeated, we, the world. Uh, now, this is not a war where, don't get confused with World War II. We weren't in the war with Japan. It was it was completely Germany against essentially Europe. And then we got into it and finished it off. Uh, it wasn't against Nazi Germany or Hitler. That was before that all happened. Hitler was in the army. He never forgave the fact that Germany was defeated, and it gave him a lot of a lot of things to think about about his future, and his future was going to be a big one, but not yet. So we're coming home. We're victorious. We're feeling pretty good about ourselves. African American soldiers fought alongside us. They thought maybe they'd be treated differently when they got home. They weren't. Jim Crow was still in effect to a lot of countries, meaning you could legally lynch somebody and get away with it. A black person, not a white person, of course. And they didn't even have to commit a crime. They, uh, the crime of speaking to a white woman was good enough to get lynched. The crime of being in a town they shouldn't be in after sundown. It's good enough to get lynched. So that background is definitely happening. And, but they had fought side by side with white people in the war, but now they're treated like slaves again. So that's in the background of the returning victorious troops, right? When they're returning, women got the right to vote, which is a big deal. Women couldn't vote in elections before then. So it started a new era of feminine power. Women started cutting their hair. They used to, have, and uh, everybody had long, long hair like you do now, uh, except for they wore them in severe buns and twisted knots because it was very based on women don't cut their hair. They wear long dresses. They dress modestly. Uh, because of the Victoria era. Victoria was a queen in England that um, too many people were under the influence of. After the war, we felt like cutting loose. And so 1920s, women started getting the right to vote. They cut their hair. They started dressing looser, more comfortably, I should say. And the kind of the party started. People wanted to get out and celebrate and dance and have a good time. But the government wasn't totally into the party starting because they made alcohol illegal. Fun guys at the air. And all of a sudden, nobody, no booze. Well, it just made people get more booze illegally. And they had these nightclubs called speakeasies. You go downstairs, tell them your name, pay a fee, and you get in and you have a good time. There's a band there, jazz band maybe, dance band. Lots of people drinking illegal liquor. And this is going on throughout the entire country. During this time of celebration and women getting more rights and more freedoms, they're smoking cigarettes in public. Oh, Oh, the scandal. The party was on, and so it was deemed the Roaring Twenties. Well, things were starting to roar in Hollywood. During this era, there was a boom in movie making like never seen before. Movie theaters are sprouting up all over the country, not just in major cities. This is long before... Cineplexes and all of that junk. 
they'd make a, maybe you come from a town that has a beautiful old theater that hopefully hasn't fallen into disrepair. Reading has one. It was called the Cascade. They built it in the 1930s, I believe. Very ornate Egyptian look. That was kind of the popular th thing of the day, style of the day for movie theaters. Uh, a lot of them had an Egyptian theme. Huge screens. Still no sound, folks. They had music. They had sound effects, but they had no dialogue spoken by people, actors. And that didn't stop people from going to the movies like crazy. And the silent movies of the 20s were some of the greatest cinema ever made. People like Abel Gantz from France making his movie Napoleon or King Vidor making his incredible film The Crowd. Um... The three comedians, Charlie Chaplin, Buster Keaton, and Harold Lloyd, became the trifecta of humor, making classic films like The Kid, After the Gold Rush, The General, and forgetting some of the titles that Harold Lloyd made. These comedians were so popular. And their humor was it's all visual because they can't speak their jokes. And people just loved it. They couldn't get enough of it. And it's very inventive movies. I'll show you some clips after I shut up, shut up today. You'll see them. Hopefully you'll watch them on, in, on Canvas. Uh, you'll see some examples of great silent films and what they're capable of. There was... Some classic silent horror films being made in Germany. Nosferatu, which was like the first vampire movie. Based on sort of Dracula myth. I've never seen Dracula look like that. He looks like a big rat. It's actually a truly terrifying film. Um, I wish we were in class right now. I'll show you an example of it. Uh, Dr. Caligari's Cabinet was another horror film that was hugely popular at the time. But a, you know, zombie traveling around. And that was what they call German Expressionism because it's all very exaggerated. The costuming, the sets, the acting. When you see acting in silent films, it seems exaggerated. Well, compared to nowadays, it is. Well, they had to pantomime everything. They had to pantomime their emotions. Think about that, folks. You're angry. How do you express that? Now you'd say a couple's choice, uh, loud F-bombs, and people go, oh, he's angry. And if you're happy, you'd say a couple low, <laughs> smiley F-bombs, and people go, oh, they're happy. It wasn't so easy in those days. And so they had to show it through physicality. And it's called pantomime acting. They did a lot of acting with their hands, with their face, with their body languages to get across their emotions. And then there's the music and the camera placement. And it's getting the sadness, the happiness, the anger, the violence. It's showing it in a visual way. Film is a visual medium, not an audio medium. It started visually moving pictures, not moving records of people talking. That came later. So in the 1920s, it was a boomtown time for silent movies. Yes, nobody missed sound movies. A lot of students... I find it hard to believe that people actually enjoy black and white movies. Well, because there was no such thing as a color movie. That was the only choice they had. And they are surprised that people could sit through a silent film without any spoken dialogue. Well, they didn't know any better. There was no such thing as a talking. So they didn't miss what they didn't have. What do, you, what do we have now that you miss? 
What don't we have? We don't know. We don't know because it's being invented right now. So people looking back at our times will go, oh, those poor, those poor people in the 21st century, oh, they didn't have what we have now. They, they never knew what that was. Well, well, you don't really miss what you don't know. <laughs> what you don't know exists. That's how it was in the 20s. And these movies by these great directors, universal directors, Europe, European directors, British directors like Alfred Hitchcock, who directed up until he died in the 1980s, uh, he was directing silent films. Some of our great American directors, like John Ford, and they were directing silent films. They survived into the sound era and great, directed some of the greatest sound films in the history of movies. So the 20s was a really fertile area. What's going on in the culture? Coming back from the war, women's rights, right to vote. The morals were getting a little bit more loose because everybody's drinking like crazy. The party is on. The music's changing. The art is changing. And that's the whole point of this course is to tell you what's going on in the culture is happening in the arts. And right now, cinema is new. Is it an art? That's up to you. you. What defines art? It's a hard one. I would consider it an art form. Um, but it's a collective art form. Mostly you can't do it by yourself. At least in those days you couldn't. You had to have a lot of people around you doing it. Camera people, lighting people, designers, set designers, stunt people, everything. Actors. Now you can do things by yourself, like a TikTok. But is that really cinema? Or is it just somebody doing something silly that's rather amusing for 30 seconds? Anyway, people were making longer and longer movies. They could sit in the theater for quite a while now. Their attention spans weren't as short as ours are now. They could sit through a 90-minute movie, a two-hour movie, no problem. It was a good night out. And so cinema was really flourishing. Then in the 1920s, there was an incident with a silent film star named Fatty Arbuckle who liked to party maybe too much. And there was a trend in the country that's Hollywood, which is where all the movies were being made mostly, uh, was getting uh, out of control when it comes to their morality, too much sex and booze and loose morals. And it was showing in the cinema. There was nudity in the cinema. There was people having sex, uh, not showing it, of course, depicting it like we do now. It was all through inference. And they weren't married, by the way. And it looked like Hollywood was destroying the moral fiber of the country, and the Catholic Church didn't like it. And the Catholic Church is usually powerful. And so they were threatening, always threatening to boycott, and that was a huge threat. And the incident with Fatty Barkle, Arbuckle kind of sensed the deal. He was one of the highest paid comedians of his time, a big heavy set fat guy who was very much a childish in all his movies. He's very childlike in his movies, and he was beloved by everybody. Well, Fatty liked the party. And he was smart enough not to party in L.A. because the eyes, the press could find, see where he was. And we didn't have social media in those days, but he would go to San Francisco, which was far enough away, and he'd do his partying there, which was smart of him. Well, he was having a party one night in a hotel, and, of course, there's lots of people in his hotel room and elsewhere in the hotel, and everybody knew who he was, movie star, 
And of course, he took advantage of that and got a lot of pretty women up to the room. Um, one of which ended up dying that night. And Fatty was charged with her murder. Uh, they found her in a bed bleeding. And the first reports was that she was um, bleeding internally because Fatty had uh, sodomized her. You have to look the word up, folks, if you want me to explain it to you. He sodomized her with a possibly a booze bottle, Coke bottle, a bottle, folks. Do I have to explain any more to you? And perforated her intestine. Thus, she bled to death in a couple of days. Fatty is now labeled a monster. Did he do that? Did he not? Then a lot of people later on, they found out he didn't do that. And uh, But because he was so heavy, they thought maybe just the act of being on top of this woman made her organs fail. That turned out not to be the case. But he was tried three times. Two trials and a hung jewelry. The third one exonerated him. They had found out that the lady was a wannabe performing actress who had had an abortion earlier that it was a botched abortion, and she was probably internally horribly mismanaged and was already sick when she got to the party. And uh, that led to her eventual death. But Fatty never got over the bad spectacle of the... Uh, you could Google all this, look at it. It's all online, folks. Um... Go to YouTube. You'll see it there. Um, he has career never recovered from this. Now, one time he was paid a million dollars a year, and that's a lot of money. Uh, nowadays, it's a lot of money, but in those days, it's a lot of money. Uh, he tried to make a comeback. He directed some films under a different name, and he died in disgrace right when the sound movies came into being. There goes Fatty, and it's and after that incident, they got a ratings board, and the ratings board judged every paint, every uh, movie that came out of Hollywood for contact, make sure that they were keeping the Catholic Church happy, and so there was pre-code movies, which was up they go up until about nineteen thirty three. And then postcode movies, which went up until the middle 60s. Uh, and the code, you can look it up, go to Wikipedia and look at the code. It's pretty absurd. The code states some of the most obvious things, and the code that it states are uh, nobody, no kissing on screen for longer than three seconds. They had somebody there timing it with a stopwatch. They felt if you kiss somebody for longer than three seconds, it's going to lead to pregnancy. That's right, folks. Uh, there was a rule that if you have a, a scene in a bedroom that nobody, if somebody's sitting on a bed, the other person can't be seen sitting on the bed with them, and the person sitting in the bed has to have one foot on the floor. It's in the code, folks. There's another part of the code where up until the 19, middle 60s was upheld in television. Even married couples were, can never, their bedrooms can never be shown to have a single bed because they had to have double beds. They had to have single beds with a table in between. Look at all old television. I Dream of Jeannie, Dick Van Dyke, all of them had single beds. We don't want to think these people are getting in to the same bed. You never saw a toilet in any movie ever or television. Now that's all we do is see toilets. You couldn't show a toilet. That was considered obscene and immoral. And so 
You couldn't show violence. You couldn't show the results of violence. That's why in old movies you never see bullet holes or bullet splatting. All the graphic violence that we see now that we're all used to, we're all like, oh, yeah, what? Look at John Wick. They have more blood spreading, brains blowing out, and we still want more. Well, they had a thing in the code uh, which said you can't allow gratuitous violence and you can't show it. So a lot of the stuff like violence and sex happened off screen. You couldn't even say the word sex. Uh, so there's a ton of stuff in the code that was really strict, but that's how the culture was. In or, and the the code had to approve your movie or your movie would not be released into movie theaters. So the Catholic Church was that powerful, and the code was that powerful. A guy by the name of Will Hayes ran the, the department of the code, and there was other people involved in that. And um, I will s s put up a couple do uh, documentaries, short one, should I see what I'm talking about here? Put a visual stamp on it. Um, there's nothing about these films in the textbook I have. If you took my film class, maybe you should. In the spring, Humanities 4, we do have a book called The Story of Film, and it covers all this stuff. But anyway, um, so that's the 20s. All of a sudden, things look pretty good. Then what happens? Wall Street disaster crashes. The Great Depression, that's what they called it, starts. But the good news is prohibition is over. People could drink again legally. So what, riot, what came to rise in the 20s with prohibition was gangsters. And um, the gangsterism was all about illegal alcohol trade. And so we had famous gangsters in Hollywood in the 30s especially started making gangster movies because that's what people wanted to see. They wanted to see that life. So movies like Scarface and Little Caesar and Public Enemy in the early 30s, before the code, by the way, and if you watch it, it's pretty brutal, um, made stars of James Cagney and, and so many more others, Paul Muni. Um, and yes, the early Scarface, pre-code Scarface is the movie that starred Al Pacino that everybody loves, made in the 80s. It's the same movie. It's a remake. Except for he's not a Cuban drug lord, he's an Italian bootlegger. Um, these movies, Edward G. Robinson is another uh, gangster star that became huge in this era. We wanted to see how these gangsters live. So these movies in the 30s became escapism from the drudgery of the Depression. People can pay their rents. They couldn't hardly feed their kids, but Hollywood made sure we got their money. And so escapism was the form of the day to get people to think about other things besides the fact they didn't have a job or they couldn't pay their rents or feed their kids. They wanted those people in the seats. And so the movies that became popular in the 1930s, besides gangster films, Another one would be musicals, Hollywood musicals, with Fred Astaire, happy feeling musicals. Bugsby, Bugsy Berkeley was another one, Busby Berkeley. Uh, big dance spectacles, because the spectacle was a beautiful thing to see. It took you out of the reality of your life for an hour or two. And maybe you would go back and see it again with a friend. <coughs> These were fantasy musicals of usually highbrow people. Um, not poor everyday people, usually. Uh, there was this thing that came out in the 30s, kind of started with a movie called It Happened One Night, Claudette Cole Barrow, Clark Gable, um, called It Happened One Night, which kind of started a trend. They, uh, they titled Screwball Comedy. Uh, you would call them rom-coms now, romantic comedies. They called them screwball comedies, and... There was a plethora of them, some of them completely, utterly brilliant, like Philadelphia Story, Bringing a Baby, anything with Carol Lombard. <laughs> she was genius at this sort of humor. 
Um, but the screwball comedies were usually poking fun at wealthy people. There's usually a message about how silly they are. Like my man Goffrey was a brilliant example of it. If we were in class, I'd be showing you a film clip of it with the great Carol Lombard. Um, another form of film in the 30s, hugely popular, was monster movies. And I don't mean horror movies, folks. Talking monsters. Frankenstein's monster. Frankenstein. Bride of Frankenstein. The werewolf. The mummy. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Dracula. Were hugely popular movies in the 1930s. Filmed in glorious black and white with actors like Boris Karloff and Bela Lugosi. Claude Rains. And we're seeing, we were seeing a type of film, a type of monster that we could control in the films because they all ended up badly. We could kill the monster in a movie. Because the monster that was happening in Europe right now, we couldn't figure out or control. No, but it was coming. Adolf Hitler was starting the rise of Nazism, National Socialist Party, and their brutal reign of terror and their grip on all of Europe. But right now, they're just in Germany in the 1930s, 19, early 30s. But we're aware of it. It's in the press. He's starting to roll. Later on in the 30s, he invades Poland, starts bombing England, and we still didn't do anything about it because our American voters did not want to be involved in another war. Our president, Franklin Roosevelt, wanted to perhaps help England, but the American people said, no, we've had enough of war. That's over there. It's not affecting us here. Well, that was soon to change when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor and that's when World War II started and all hell broke out. But that's not to the next decade. We're still in the 30s. The 1930s saw change after change in cinema. The first color films were starting to happen. Wizard of Oz, maybe you've heard of it. Half of it's in black and white. When they're in Oz, it's in color because they wanted to show this fantasy world of this beautiful thing called Oz. Now, that's 1939, towards the end of the 30s, obviously. And then there was Gone with the Wind, 1939, also completely in color. Color film was starting to happen, but it was a special process, an expensive process. And it was used very sparingly. But towards the end of the decade, in the 1930s, um, FDR, our president at the time, Franklin Roosevelt, uh, signed this thing called a New Deal, and it put people back to work building infrastructure, bridges, buildings in New York, Chicago, Pittsburgh. The highway system throughout the United States was starting to be constructed, put people back to work. And that was a good thing. And when people started going back to work, movies changed. They became more elaborate. They became more expensive to make. People wanted to see more spectacle, like Wizard of Oz, like Gone with the Wind. And the decade ended with 1939 being one of the most seminal era, era in all of Hollywood, history of all of cinema history, because still not much is happening in Europe because they're starting to get go into war not much is happening in any parts of the world because it takes a lot of money to make these movies. There are some films being made in Japan, but not very many. Plus, they're not getting out into our world. Well, this is before we had film festivals and everything else. So the films were screened in their own countries. Uh, people were making films in Germany, some great German expressionistic films. But what was happening in Germany, a lot of the filmmakers there 
who were Jewish fled the country so they wouldn't be put in concentration camps. William Wilder, Billy Wilder, King Vidor, Otto Preminger, and many, many more fled the country of their birth because they were Jews. And they saw the writing on the wall. It was in a good place to be a Jew. So, that's what's going on in the world out there. 1939 it was a bumper crop of Hollywood success. Some of those popular films, groundbreaking films in cinema history were put out in that one year. People were so glad to be back to be able to make stories. And because we're storytellers, because telling our story is telling our story. And so just to give you an example, in one year, John Ford, the director who gave us The Informer, Drapes of Wrath, He get in three in one year he directed Young Mr. Lincoln. He usually directed historical dramas. He gave a stagecoach, a groundbreaking western that changed westerns forever and made John Wayne a star. And they made Drums Along the Mohawk, another uh, historical film set in the Revolutionary time Revolutionary War times. All in one year. How can they how can one director make three films in one year. Well, things were different then. The Hollywood had a system, a studio system. They owned these huge buildings, studios, maybe you've heard of them, Universal, Paramount, 20th Century, MGM, and they owned their huge ways and means of making the movies, the cameras, they owned the lighting, they owned the materials, and they employed thousands of people. Disney would be part of that. In the animation world, uh, not yet in the live world yet. That's coming though, meaning live action. Uh, his 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 movies were starting to get internationally known. His animation, so Snow White, Seven Doors, Fantasia, where he was taking animation when no one thought it was possible. It was no longer just funny, cute cartoons. It was art on a serious level. The game was afoot. The 1930s, probably one of the, the most explosive eras in all of cinema. Technology is changing. The cameras are changing. They're getting smaller. 1927, sound was introduced. A movie called The Jazz Singer, although it would come out earlier in another film. Jazz Singer is... There's only half sound, by the way. The rest of it's silent. He does sing. You can't hear him. And there's some spoken dialogue, but it was still primitive. And so half the film was still silent. And people never say anything like this. When sound came along, it changed everything. From now on, sound was going to dominate. And for the next five or ten years, it did. Movies suffered for it because it went from a visual medium to a sound medium. People standing and talking, sitting and talking. Instead of doing things, moving around like a movie, they sat and talked. And that changed everything also until they found a balance between the visual and the audio. And then we have cinema of the 1940s. And I'm going to cover that another time because I'm talked out folks. Anyway, see you next time when the story of film continues.